I, and you know me, I'm not big on holidays, but Memorial is one, Memorial Day is one of those days that you really take a step back and are thankful for where we live. I know there's a lot of strife people have and people have angst, but really, would you rather be anywhere else? We have the freedom of movement, freedom to come to church, be able to worship God and speak truth without any problems. And we pray that that lasts as long as he wills. Let's go ahead and continue um, this morning in prayer, and then we'll jump into our lesson this morning. God, as we come to, to you this morning, we, we do have angst in our hearts and, and people we love and who are concerned about. Those who are um, also of us but not with us, uh, we know that there are several people who are still ill, who are fighting either uh, diseases or, or recovering from injury. Help us to be, we're there with them in mind, in spirit, and grace and mercy, showing who you are through our activity. We thank you for this morning. Help us to be able to put aside the distraction, to understand who you are, to realize that you are a God who rewards those who eagerly seek him. We thank you for that. Help us to continue on with our, with our understanding of truth. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. All right. So we're continuing on our uh, lessons on rewards, and today we'll be getting into the evaluation. So this is not the actual study of what the rewards are just yet. Last week we did a, a kind of a, uh, a review of the fact that we will be evaluated. The unfortunate commonality when it comes down to most circles within the evangelical community believe that the reward is heaven eternal life is the reward and so therefore they attach all of the reward passages with the grace passages and say see it's by grace you initiate and it is by the works or the activity or the service that you do to make sure you get in and we know that that's not true, uh, but there's still kind of this unusual kind of angst about getting rewarded. Well, I mean, God's already given me everything I could possibly want. He's going to give me more. There's going to be more reward. And that is the reality of reward. So the reality of evaluation that we saw last hour, that the believers will be evaluated, not to see whether or not they have eternal life that's sealed but to find out exactly what is rewardable, what types of rewards they will get. I am not the arbiter. I'm not the one who decides this. We're just simply going through scripture and finding out where it talks about these kind of ideas. So as we saw last week, uh, a believer's life will be evaluated, but the believer's service is not subject to condemnation or punishment. Rather, it is subject to rewards. Who will be doing the evaluating? Now, that may sound like a silly question for most of us, but there are some people who have some weird ideas about the evaluation process. So we want to make sure we just handle that very quickly and we'll move on to what will be evaluated. Rewards are the divine acknowledgement of services rendered or sacrifice rendered. So there is a difference between an individual who is a believer and does nothing in their life worthy of God. They don't do any good works. They don't do any service. They don't witness. All they do is basically, thank you, God. I'll see you there. And the individual who spends their life trying to service and help, uh, help other people understand truth and witnessing. There is a difference between those two individuals. Now, again, most evangelical circles says, well, I don't even know if that person over here who didn't do anything is saved. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that there is a reward difference. Now, I, I talked with somebody recently about this. They go, well, won't that create jealousy? Well, we're looking at this from the perspective of the human frailty, the human viewpoint within sin. When we get to heaven, will there be jealousy? I won't have a sin nature. So therefore, when I see Bert and everything that he has, and here I have with my little well, I don't know, dust, I'm not going to go, man, really? So I, I, it won't be that type of reaction. 
what kind of reaction will it be? I, I, I'm assuming we'll be happy for one another. We'll be, we'll, be desi- we'll be desiring for the benefit of one another. We'll be treating each other with love, not with envy or jealousy. The evaluation we know, now I'm going to just throw this out there initially. We'll go ahead and get back to it momentarily, is that the evaluation is completed at the bema. The bema, which is translated the judgment seat of Christ. I don't like the word judgment because that makes it sound like gavels and punishment. And that's not what is happening here. Remember, first and foremost, whenever you start looking at words like reward or judgment or anything like that, make sure you remember Romans 8.1. There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, period. It's, it, and there's, there's several verses that e- echo that as well. So it's not just one verse. you got John 3.18. You have John 3.36, John 4, John 6. There's various verses that say you do not come into judgment. But let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 to take a look at this Bema section. And again, we're looking at this from the perspective of who will evaluate. We're not there yet to what will be evaluated, but who will evaluate. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. Therefore, being of always, uh, always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. Why? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's Bema. That the word judgment seat is Bema. So that each of one may be recompensed, paid back for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, I want to talk about that word bad, bad word. I would say it's even a bad translation. We'll talk about that word in, in the next section. But I want to make sure we understand here who is the evaluator. Judgment seat of Christ. So that's where we need to make sure we understand. Now, this is repeated several times. Look over Romans chapter 14. Romans 14, verse 10. Here. I love this because it's talking about the same concept. And who are we standing before? Why judge your brother? Or again, why do you hold your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. So who's this equating? Jesus and God. I I don't want to get into a Trinitarian question right now, but I think it's pretty clear. Also, Matthew chapter 16 Verse 27. Now, we've got to be careful with this. We're just setting a principle of who is the evaluator. For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory with his Father, a glory of his Father with his angels, and will then repay every man according to his deeds. All judgment has been given to whom? The judgment of God has been transferred over to the person, the humanity of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 10. Forty two. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as the judge of the living and dead. And the person in context is Jesus Christ. So where is this occurring? There is a there's a consequence there. Jesus Christ is coming. That's number one. There is a 
a concept of the spiritual realm, not the physical realm, although there is a physical realm judgment in Matthew 24 when he comes back and sets foot. But what we're looking at for the believer is that this is a judgment within the spiritual realm, not the physical. Also, the judgment um, is not the question of whether the believer will shall enter heaven but or whether he shall remain in heaven. It's not like, oh, you made it, but we're going to kick you out early. You only have a two-year stay based upon your works. It doesn't say anything like this. The reason I mention it is because there are people who actually try to add words to this in order to try to make sense of rewards passages when they try to mix it up with salvation passages. Throughout the history of the church, there have been several misconceptions about who is the evaluator. Uh, I'm not sure if you've ever heard, there's a, there's a song, My Father's Eyes by Amy Grant. You know, I remember this from my, my youth, and everyone else got like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, but there's a song, and there's, there's doctrines out there that say that people will be coming before God to give an accounting of my activity. And so the evaluator is actually within our people who we love and care for and what we say about each other. Did we read any of that? We, why, do, why do they say these types of things? Why do, they, why do they mention or get the idea that they have other people as the evaluator of your life? To be very careful of how you treat each other. I mean, it, it's all done to, in order to manipulate and not do things in an appropriate manner according to God's word. The evaluator is Jesus Christ. And there's no other individual mentioned within scripture that will be doing this evaluation. God, yes, but God gave the authority, according to the end of Matthew, to Jesus Christ as the arbiter. He is the one who will figure this out. Now, this is not these words, what we've read so far, 2 Corinthians, Romans, Matthew, Acts, is not the same as Revelation 20. I want you to turn over there just to see the, the difference. And we need to... We'll probably revisit this at some point. Probably on at nine o'clock in December, maybe. Not not December? What year? Maybe maybe next. Maybe next December. Okay. <laughs> so in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. People get a crazy idea of what's happening here. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne and the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which are written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up their dead, which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead, which were in them, and they were judged according, uh, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown in the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, is this a place where we will be? Will I be standing before the great white throne? How do I know that? I'm answering a question. Bert's aunt shaking his head no. How do we know that I will not be standing, you will not be standing before the great white throne judgment? Who? Huh? Well, why do you know that? It says dead. <laughs> Are you dead? At this point, in this point in history, what's, what's going on right now? Where are we? We are alive. We're not dead. The dead is a moniker. It's a, it's a name for unbelievers. This is, you know what? Let's get all the unbelievers who have ever died. Let's bring them out of hell. Let's bring them out of the sea. It's, a, it's Again, it's visual, right? And we're going to gather them all together, and God's going to say, let's go ahead and do this one more time. You've already been found wanting. Let's go ahead and, and, and judge you according to your deeds to find out if you get into my heaven. And in chapter 21, verse 8, but the cowardly and the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. I'm not sure if you're a liar or not, but I mean, people are like, oh, I'm not I'm not I'm not a murderer. No more uh, liars I hate when they do that. They always drop the bar. 
Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's a pretty high standard if you look at it. Okay. And they'll say, oh, so you don't, if you're any of these things, you don't get in. That's not what it says. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you have a different identification. You have the identification of as a believer, as an individual who is in God, who has the righteousness of God. You are no longer known for or known as being a bad person. That's not who you are. The bumper sticker phrase, I'm a sinner saved by grace, is no longer accurate. You are a holy one. You are set apart by God. You are sanctified by God. That's who you are, even though we do sin, even though we battle against the sin nature currently. But that's not who you are. Unbelievers, how are they known? They're known by their sins. And so God is going to bring up the unbeliever and say, what have you done? Let me go ahead and evaluate your life. And the person says, I've been very good. Let's see. You don't qualify. Even if you're not the worst person, you still don't qualify. Why? Because you don't have the righteousness of God. They're not righteous enough. And that's the issue. So this is not here dealing with the evaluation of believers. I want to make that absolutely clear this morning, and I hope I have. So turn on that over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and let's talk about the evaluation of the believer. I will admit immediately that 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and chapter 4 are about ministers, ministries. The, the context is Paul and Apollos. Turn over to chapter 4, verse 6, which is after verse 5, the second section of my notes here. So in verse 6, what does he say? Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that you may learn not to exceed what was written, so that none of you become arrogant in behalf of one another. So he's applying it to himself and Apollos, but there is an indirect application to all believers. So we got to be careful not to apply everything here, but we'll be able to see the principle of what's occurring. In chapter 3, verse 9, it says, For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. So he's differentiating here. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. What is the it? He's talking to the Corinthian church. You are the building. I laid the foundation. Other people are coming in and building upon that foundation. So it's not about every single individual, but I believe it can understand the principle behind it to see how God will evaluate. Now, for no, verse, verse 11, for no other man can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. Ooh, okay. You're following so far. So you're going to be building on top of the foundation. Paul laid the foundation. Other people are coming in like Apollos and building upon it. And he's building either with wood, hair, straw, or gold, silver, and precious stones. If any man's work after it's being tested by fire, if any man's work which has been built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer a loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. Now, here's the question you have when you deal with this text. Is the wood, hay, and straw evil deeds? If it is, why does it need to be revealed with fire? The quality is known from the very beginning. See, the wood, hay, and straw is not bad deeds. It's not evil deeds. It is good deeds that are not quality. He's building upon the foundation that God has set, which is Jesus Christ, and the church is the building, and people are building within the church. They're serving the church, but sometimes the, the, the work is not good quality. 
And the fire, figuratively, according to First to Corinthians 4, 6, is going to be tested. God will go ahead and determine what is quality work or not. How, what, is, what makes a work good quality? Is it the materials that we have in this church? If someone comes here and says, you know what? I built a better church than the other church because that's all wood, and this one is actually made of brick. Concrete all the way to the top. Therefore, see, but no, that's not what it's talking about, right? What is it talking about? Chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Let a man regard this, let, let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. But to me, it is a very small thing that I be examined by you or any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. We already established that. Therefore, do not go passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things in the darkness and disclose the motives of each man's heart. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. What makes a good quality work? Motivation. Why are you doing what you're doing? So God, right here, you're looking at us, and is it possible, is it possible, not probable, is it possible that what Paul did in Corinth will be burned up? Yeah. And we can look at it and go, he did a lot of good things. Yes, but why did he do it? And he goes, I don't think I'm doing it for the wrong reasons. But I'm not the judge of that. God will disclose this. And I find that to be both um, challenging and reassuring. Right? I want you to make sure that you understand that this is not character building. Character building is established in Ephesians 4, Galatians 5, 2 Peter 1. That's, this is not trial by fire. Okay? This is not you going through difficulties and saying, oh, see, my character is being revealed. It's not what it says. The work is being tested when Christ comes back. It is the believer's good works or service that which is being evaluated. These are the works that have been determined by God that we should walk in them. Remember Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, he says that God has prepared good works that we should walk in them. And so if we're walking in good works, we're doing what we're supposed to do. We're following the instructions. What changes? What makes it a good work that is rewardable? Hmm. A quick evaluation of this passage, we can go ahead and see and understand, and I already mentioned this, this passage is about those who build upon the foundation, and it has a direct application for those working in ministry, working in the building of the actual ecclesia, not the actual physical building, but the body of believers, the people who are working in that. A secondary application is also evident. This is the principle of works being tested. All believers will have their building materials examined, so to speak. Okay, so if you if you think you're doing okay, you know, God's going to be the one that's going to judge your good works. The building material again is not good works and bad works; rather, both materials seem to have worth by a human evaluation. Okay, people look at it and go, "Yeah, they're all doing good." How many times do we find out later on after we, we go ahead and give high praise to certain people in ministry and find out they're not really the person we thought they were? God is the one who's going to judge those motivations. God is the one who's going to. This is why we got to be very careful saying, oh, I know why he's doing that. Uh, careful. Because motivation is, is individual. It's within the spirit of the man. God knows. And sometimes even the person doing it doesn't know, to be honest. Suffering loss is not punitive. Oh, he's going to suffer loss. He's going to be put aside for the thousand years. That's not what it says. The one being evaluated believed he did great and rewardable work, but then he has nothing left after the test of quality. 
It is the quality is evaluated by the revealing of the hidden things, the motivation of each one's work. What is a proper motivation? Simply, what is a proper motivation? This is where we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Right after Paul talks about using the gospel, that, that it's, it's appropriate for people to earn a living from proclaiming the gospel. It's appropriate. Paul, however, I have used none of these things. And I am not writing these things so that you will be you will do so in my case. I don't want your money. For I would be it would be better for me to die than have any man make my boast an empty one. In other words, I'm doing this free of charge so that I can go ahead and be recognized by God. If I'm doing this for money, then perhaps I need to check my motivation. He's, he's making the, the case that if I do this for gain, my boast is empty. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. Paul is a different case. Be careful here. Paul's an apostle. He's like Jonah. If Paul didn't want to, guess what? There's there's pokes and prods, and God's knocking them off the horses, lights, blinding, all kinds of stuff, okay? So God's going to force him. He's under compulsion to function. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me, what then is my reward? The question that is posed in verse 18 is not answered in, in verse 18. It's kind of like that counter argument. If I do this voluntarily, I have a reward. If I don't do it voluntarily, what's my reward? Nothing. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. We'll continue reading in verse 18, though, that which I that when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more to the Jews. I became as a Jew so that I might win Jews to those who are under the law as under the law, though not being under the law myself, so that I might win those who are under the law. He's empathizing. He's understanding where they're at so he can communicate to them better. To those without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I, might, I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives a price? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it for a perishable wreath. We do it for an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I discipline my body and I make it my slave. So that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. And again, it's not a disqualification from heaven, but disqualified from the reward. In this particular passage, we have several things. Number one, Paul is charged with a task. He must do what God has instructed, or there is woe. It's the same woe in Revelation, by the way. It's the same woe given by Christ to the Pharisees in Matthew. There is woe. If he doesn't do it, whoa. Second, Paul, if Paul does the task willingly because he wants to, he has a reward, a mythos. Paul is stating that if he does, if he does what has been entrusted to him against his will, in other words, I don't really want to do this, but I have to, there's no, there's no reward. So this kind of brings to light what's happening in 1 Corinthians 3, the motivation. Paul's actions in verses 19 to 23 are done in light of his desire and willingness to be a soon koinonos, a fellow partaker, a fellow, uh, basically a fellowship with the gospel. It is not an imperative, but it is a good example. 
The heart of Paul as a willing participant is on display so that we can learn from him. Service under the Lord is allegorized as a race. In the following context of chapter 10, we find out that the failings is going back to problems, back to idolatry for the Corinthian church, back to immorality. So the failings of the race is basically you didn't finish it. You didn't stay with it to the end. And there are several times we'll talk about next week in which the reward seems to be a finish to the end reward. You, you kept it to the end. You ran the race. You finished the fight. You completed the course. You didn't go 20 years and then go, you know what? I'm going to retire. A minister's work is never done. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31 to 33, notice what he says as the instruction after the race analogy. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jew or Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many so that they may be saved. Paul's motivation, his heart, is for the people he's speaking to. It's not for his own glory. I have many times argued the clarity of the gospel just to win an argument. Because I get looked at as, wow, he knows how to argue well. He is a very persuasive guy. And I have honestly at times realized after the fact, going, man, I really did that for the wrong reason. I did a good thing. Argue for the clarity of the gospel, not by works, but by grace. And I've shown this, but at times I know myself and I've checked my motivation that I'm not really doing it for the benefit of the people hearing. I'm doing it because I want to be praised by men. And when you do it to be praised by men, guess what? You're going to get what you want. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 and 10. Back to the Bema. I wanted to kind of clarify this for you. I mentioned it already before. What's going on here with the evaluation? At the end of verse 10, it, at verse 10 it says again, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So it makes it look like that the people who are believers but are evil will be recompensed for evil. Okay? Is that what it says? What are being evaluated? The things that are done in the body, whether agathos or phallos. Okay? There's two words here. Notice that this word is not the typical word for evil or bad. That's the word kakas. Okay? Sarah hates that word. That's one reason why I say it a lot. This is a different word. What's this word mean? Well, first of all, agathos is a, a good in accordance with a godly standard. So when we're doing things, God's going to say, well, is it according to my standard as good? You think it might be good. And honestly, a lot of times we do things that are advantageous, but are not necessarily God good. He's going to evaluate what's, what's really good. And what's bad? Well, phallus is a qualitative word that evaluates something as being low grade or substandard. Or inferior in quality. This should be translated worthless, base, or paltry. In other words, you think you're doing good. God's going, ah, it's, it's not really the kind of quality I'm looking for. Remember, sin is paid for at the cross. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. This is not an evaluation of your sin. Sin's not dealt with. He's wondering whether or not your good works are low grade or substandard. Or are they... According to his standard, it goes back to First Corinthians chapter three and four. Are this are the works that are being is the, is the building material being used of high quality or low quality? If it's low quality, huh, you, you did your work in accordance with what you want man to see. That's really what I believe it is. Are you doing it for God and what He thinks is valuable, or are you doing it for man's service? Are you doing it because you want to, or because you feel like you have to? Now, how many times do you think I've gotten up here 
I've taught a lesson. I've been in my office all week working hard because I have to. Because I have a stewardship entrusted to me. More than I'd like to count, to be honest. But I also know there are times, and this is where I really kind of like, oh, I, 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 I feel more confident when I go, I'm here because I want to be. I'm in that office because I want to be. I'm standing up here because I want to be. I'm trying to help people individually because I want to. And we all have to basically look at this. Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing because I want to, because I'm trying to please God and not just trying to make a paycheck? If I ever get to the point where all I, if I feel like I ever, just my only motivation is a paycheck, I promise you, I will resign. Because I, because I, it's, it's, I, I need to fix myself before I continue. Basically, I'm not there yet. To be pleasing, because it says that we want to be pleasing to Him. Oh, what a great word! Fantastic word. And we can go through Scripture to find out what is pleasing to God. What do you think is pleasing to God? Well, in Romans chapter 12, we have the first clue. Verses 1 and 2. We, if you don't have this memorized, see me after class. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of, of service. I don't like the word worship there at all. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what that which is good and acceptable and perfect there's two words here, translated acceptable, it's the same word for pleasing. Eurestos. It's good, it's well pleasing, it's good pleasing. So what God sees as acceptable or pleasing to him, that is rewardable, of course, with the caveat, you check your motivation. So if you make yourself a living sacrifice, you're, you present your bodies to God saying, this is, this, is my, this, is my, this is my body, this is my life, it's for you. And you work, and you can transform your mind. You, trans you have a transformation by the renewed mind, by the way, so that you may demonstrate, you're going to demonstrate that which is good and acceptable and perfect. That is what God deems pleasing to him. So you don't have to be in ministry to do this. Anybody can do this. You can transform your mind. You can present your body and say, you know what? This is not, I don't want to do what my flesh wants. I want to do what you want, God. Romans chapter 14, verse 16. This is kind of like the, the, the principles of conscience and, and doing things with other people in mind. Do not let for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ, it is acceptable to God and approved by men. Same word. It pleases God to know that you're willing to sacrifice even food for righteousness, peace, and joy. Now, again, people take this out of context and they run with it. Don't do that understand the context but we want to understand that if we do personal sacrifices for the benefit of others god is well pleased philippians chapter 4 15 through 18. Paul explains that the Philippian church has more than once given a gift to Paul so that he may be able to go through the other locations to serve them. And he said he received everything. And in verse 18, but I have received everything in full and have abundance, and I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Supporting individuals, 
supporting efforts to spread the gospel, helping those with physical provisions who are working in ministry. That sacrifice, what you're giving, is acceptable to God. This is not an ask for money. It's a demonstration of what God, what people can do. Because sometimes you're faced with, what can I do? I'm not in ministry. I have responsibilities. I have family. I have work. And I just don't have the time to go out on Saturdays and, and pass out pamphlets. That's not what I'm asking anyway. But you want to help. There's other ways to do it than being in full-time ministry or being in part-time ministry. You can support those who do it. And that, that by God, is acceptable. Finally, James 1 and I'm, I've bent my understanding a little bit. I'm not sure if you've heard me say this before. I've said in the past that not doing, that basically avoiding sin is not rewardable. That's what's expected of us. And I still generally hold to that statement. However, if you're able to resist temptation, and temptation's always an idea of temp tempting to sin. If you can resist temptation by means of God's word, speaking to motivation of why you're why you're avoiding the sin, it produces something that is imperishable and results in a crown. Verse 2 of James 1. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials as temptations, knowing that your the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect results, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And verse 12, blessed is a man who perseveres under temptation, who withstands it. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. That's the love factor. Why did I not cheat on my wife? Well, because my wife would kill me. That's not the proper motivation. What is the proper motivation? Loving God, understanding your role and responsibility, understanding the truth of God, and doing it because you don't want to. Okay, there's that difference there. There is a speaking to motivation here. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, if for right now, for a little while, it's necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the demonstration of faith, and the proof is a bad translation there, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when you're able to withstand the trial, the temptation, the pressures of this world, using God as your proper motivation, it is more precious than gold, which is perishable. God will reward at that day. In conclusion... Functioning in a world through the doctrines we believe, wanting to please God rather than men, even the avoidance of sin can be rewardable. Evaluating this life through the biblical worldview, instead of the worldview of Satan and the system he has created, is honorable to God and will be rewarded. It's important to understand, though, that not every seeming good work is rewardable. It must be both good in accordance with what God said, coupled with the proper motivation. And this is where we, we, we want, want to check ourselves. Am I just doing this because this is what I'm being pressured to do it by my friends? You know, I went to I went to like Bible camp one time and we all went passing out tracks. And I'm going, I don't want to pass out tracks, but everyone else is doing it. And I don't want to be made fun of. So I went and passed out tracks. And I, afterwards, I have people like going, well, you didn't seem like you had a good time. I go, I didn't. I didn't have a good time at all. And they go, well, you know, at least you did a good work. I, remembering this whole situation now, I'm going, eh, maybe. I don't know. And again, I don't like the idea of tracks anyway. It's a verbal thing. So I hope you're understanding what is rewardable. Now, next week, we will talk about what then is the reward. What is the reward? What's going on? What is what what can we expect? What does God reveal to us as what the reward is? It's gonna be fun. Um, after that, so that's my final lesson on rewards. After that, we will have a special speaker at 10 o'clock for a couple weeks. Speaking on the doctrine of can I tell him? 
to load the topic. I, they know who the speaker is by now. Okay. He'll be talking about the doctrine of the rapture and understanding the rapture and the and the various different points and, and what why we know what we know when the rapture is. Not date, not tomorrow. If it's tomorrow, never mind. You'll know. But we'll be talking about the doctrine of the rapture. And so that will be in, in two weeks. Next week, we'll finish up with rewards. All right. Let's go ahead and pray and uh, and and um, give this more thought. I need to. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you have given us this opportunity to read and to study and to grow. Help us to do all things in accordance with your truth, being pleasers of God and not pleasers of men. Help us to do so regularly. Help us to check our motivation and to understand what is good and acceptable in your eyes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.